Hi, it's Miss Sherbin again from the Amtrak train to Boston, and I am going over lesson 18, mechanisms of red day. Questions? Questions and answers, and we're going to be going through page 97 through 99. Okay. Um, so I wasn't able to do a guided instruction video for this one, but we did cover a lot in class, so I feel comfortable with that. Um, all right. So the first question asks, how can a person receive two different alleles? So if you remember, alleles are different types of traits. Well, you have mom, you have pa, and they each have different sets of um, chromosomes in their sex cells, the sperm and the egg, and they come together during fertilization, and they make a complete set. And on each different ones of mom and pa, are alleles. So since you have two parents, you can have received two alleles. Please remember again, you can pause and rewind at any moment if you'd like. Number two, how can you tell an allele is dominant? Hmm. Well, let's think about it. When in class, we usually look at is someone's ears attached or detached? Like mine are detached, and most people's ears are attached. Um, so we know that that gene for the attached ears is dominant. We can also look at eye color. Brown eyes are dominant. So that's why most people in the world have brown eyes. If the dominant allele is present, that trait will be displayed. So um, whenever it's there, that's the one you're going to see. That's the one that's the allele. The dominant allele is the one that's always expressed. And it masks the recessive allele. Ooh. Turbulence. <laughs> All right. Three, what is one difference between a Punnett square and a pedigree chart? Well, I'm glad you asked. So let's look at it for a second. Here is a handy dandy Punnett square, and here is a pedigree chart. Well, let's think about it for a second. I wanted to take a look before I answered. So, one, um, it has it can show you, like the pedigree can show you if it's a male or female, like box or circle. It um, also, it doesn't show you specifically the probability. Like here, you, these are the parents and these are the offspring, correct? And these aren't all different offspring. Right? These are the probability the offspring will get a trait. Here are definite offspring. Um, it shows marriages. It also, this one shows one, two, three generations. It can show many generations. This one only shows two generations, for example. What do you mean by that? Like, oops, here's one parent, here's another parent, this is one generation, and then here's the possible offspring, it's another generation. Um, all those you could choose from. I chose uh, to talk about the generations. Oops. So a pun square only shows two generations where a pedigree shark can show many. Four, a plant square has four boxes. Oops. Does that mean four offspring are produced? Oh, no. Think about it. Um, in our project for genetic counseling, when you guys received patients and were asked to determine if they or their future offspring would have a genetic disorder, you looked at the probability you, they, not everybody has four children, and these don't show every single trait either, but it shows a probability of having one, two, three, or four different offspring. It's not that they're going to have those four offspring, right? It's just a chance that one of those offspring will get that gene. So I wrote, no, a pun is square shows the probability of different gene combinations of alleles appearing in offspring, not the actual number of offspring. What are two traits determined by incomplete dominance? So incomplete dominance is when it requires more than one gene to determine that trait. So um, for example, like the dimples are determined by one gene, not by many, but things like height, um, skin color, blood type, and even like other plants like flowers, um, like flower color in plants can be incomplete dominant. Um, think about how you have all those different variations of um, eye color, hair color, that is caught, that's between everybody. And you may have a different hair color between your two parents, that's because they shared a collection of genes and 
that different variety determined yours. So that's what I mean by incomplete dominance, that I can't be determined by one set of um, alleles. Okay, so now we're doing questions six through nine, and I'm actually really excited about these questions. I don't know why. We have, it's been a while since we've done Punnett squares. Um, six through nine. For each question, write your answers in the spaces provided. Base your answers on questions six through nine on the paragraph and the diagrams below. So if you remember that word cross, what do you get when you cross a tall plant with short plant? That means like when you breed, when you mate, um, when they exchange and cross genes, okay? So that's what we mean. So we have tall stems, short stems, all equal to tall genes. Tall stems cross with short stems. Afterwards, second cross means that we take these, and they're over here. And we get three-fourths tall stems and one-fourth short stems. Hmm. Sounds like we might have a mystery in our hands. How did we get short plants from all tall plants? Okay, so let's look into this. Give me one second. Okay. So now I'm ready to draw and read. Alright. Like people, pea plants have traits that are easily recognizable. One such trait is stem height. Some people, some pea plants have tall stems and some have short stems. A scientist crossed tall stem plants with short stem plants. All of the offspring from this first cross had tall stems. Right here. Alright, so this is a first cross. Then he crossed two of the offspring of the two of the offspring. Of the offspring from this second cross, three fourths had tall stems and four shorts had small stems. Okay. So these are results. So um, before we go looking to the questions, let's talk about how this is possible. Let's just do a review. So I want to take a look at the first cross. So if you remember, I always ask you guys to like hear this one. Alright, we know that big T equals is dominant. It's really hard for me to write like this, guys. So D right there, top, dominant, and it stands for tall. Okay. Um, and then little d, T. Little t is recessive. It makes it short. This is so hard. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's say that we know if it's short. We had do our little um, on the like our little key. We know that T, big T, big T, right, are tall, and big T and little T are both tall, right? But we also know that little T, little T is short. So that's our little key. Okay, so that means it's short. So we know right here we have short stems. So I know one parent is small t, small t. And I know one parent in this cross is tall, but I don't know if it's big T, big T, or big T, little t yet. So I'm just going to put a big T. This is a question mark, right? So if I go down, 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 across, across, I'm going to see what I get. So let's see. I'm going to bring down. So I'm going to take this T, bring it down, all right, and take this T, little T, bring it down, bring this T and bring it across. All right, now I know that all of my offspring have to be tall. So this one's tall, check. This one's tall, check. But what does this need to be right here in order to make this tall? If I do little t, it's going to be short, so I can't. It has to be a big T. So this one right here, we know is a big T. All right. So now we know all the offspring. Saying all the offspring in the cross were big T, little t. No matter what they're all. That's what all of them are going to be. So it doesn't matter which two the scientists pick. We know that this cross now is exactly a big T, little t, big T, Little t. Alright, so I'm gonna go down, down, and across, and across. And that's why we have one four short stems. That one, this guy here, that's the only short one. Okay, so that's why we have one four short. And these three, 
are tall. Alright, so that's how that worked. Now let's go on to the questions. Oops. Okay. Based on observations in the diagram above, which is most likely to be dominant in the pea plant? Ah, I kind of gave that away. Sorry, guys. But we know because all, even though we have a short stem and we have a tall, we know the T was dominant um, because all the offspring came out short. If short was dominant, then all of them would have been short. Oops. So the trait of the tall stem is dominant. <laughs> Number seven. If the dominant allele for stem height is indicated by capital T and the recessive allele is indicated by lowercase t, what combination of alleles does a particular short stem have? So if you think about it, right? Big T, big T, it's tall, and big T, little t, these are all tall, right? And then the only way we can have a short plant is by with two little t's. And that's because there's no dominant allele to um, mask the recessive gene. So the just recessive gene can be expressed. So a plant with a short stem has a combination of little t, little t, or homozygous recessive. All right, this brings us to our secret word. And the secret word for this one is stem. All right, what is the probability of having a plant with short stems? If both of the plant, both parent plants have short stems, explain your answer. So the probability would be, whoa, 400, 404, or 100 percent. The offspring would have short stems because they're probably not receive any dominant alleles um, stems from their parents. So from their parents. So if you want to see what that means or what that looks like, continue. So we know that the only combination for two short plants is little t, little t. So if we go down, down, now cross, cross, we'll see that 100% of them will be short. Okay, number nine. Construct a Punnett square to show the results of crossing two pea plants with combination big T, little t, or heterozygous. What is the probability of the offspring having probability of having offspring with tall stems and short stems? So, um, just remember this is probably the most helpful way to go about it. Is remember that these are tall, and these are short. All right. So so even though I made this key a couple of times, I think it's helpful. So here's our tall. Right. This one is short. And I know it's hard to read, but you guys are listening too. Okay. All right. So we want to know what the um, short stem is. So we're going to be looking for our offspring with this combination. Okay. So we're crossing big T, little t. So let's take the big T, heterozygous. So we know these guys are tall. And here's one for each parent. Notice I didn't mix them up, that this is one parent, right? And this is another parent. You don't mix them up. You keep them on the same side. That's really important. So um, remember we did the sperm and egg. That helps us distinguish them. So let's go down, down, and cross. So down, down. We go across. All right, and we want to know the probability of having offspring with tall and short stems. Ooh, see, they approve tall and short stems. So I would say tall, the probability would be, let's see, this one's tall. So that's one out of four. This one's tall, two out of four. This one is tall, three out of four. Or 75%. Then we want to know the probability of short. And right here is our only short plant. So short would be 1 out of 4, which, again, if I combine with that, equals 100%. So that's one way I can check it. Or 
and here we go, 25 plus 25 equals 100, so I know I'm correct. Okay, now on for, sorry, now on for our multiple choice questions, number 10. If a baby goat received a dominant gene for curly hair from one parent and received a recessive gene for straight hair from the other, which trait will the baby goat display, or which trait will be expressed? No hair? That's not an option. Curly hair? Well, the curly hair was dominant, so probably. And straight hair said was recessive, so probably curly hair. So, so we have one, no hair, two, curly hair, three, straight hair, four, curly and straight hair. So it said over here that the dominant gene for curly hair, the dominant gene was curly. So we know that dominant mass is recessive allele, so it's going to be curly hair. Oops. All right. Number 11. If the allele for brown eyes, big B, is dominant, and the allele for blue eyes, little b, is recessive, which combination could produce a child with blue eyes? So, we know that this one has a dominant, so it's going to be brown. This one has a dominant, so it's going to be brown. Number 3. Huh. Two recessive traits. Homozygous recessive could show blue eyes. And here, remember that the lowercase um, in front of the uppercase makes no difference. It doesn't matter what order you put it in. So one and four are basically the same option. The dominant allele is still going to mass recessive. So it is three. All right, number 12. What is a pedigree chart used for? So if you remember, a pedigree chart looks like, hold on, pedigree chart looks like this, alright, thank you, um, and one is a list for the traits of a family, two, a track inherited, to track inherited traits over several generations, like to monitor, three, to compare the genes of different species, Four to show different combinations of genes. Well, for like a pedigree um, chart doesn't show the different combinations; it shows the different expression. But can't be four. Compare different genes of species. There's no different species here. And list all the traits of families. Not list, and we don't know all the traits. This one just could be tracking one of them. So it's to compare different gene um, to track. Sorry, track different inherited traits over several generations. Okay. Oops. All right, number 13. A scientist drawing a pun and square it is probably trying to figure out, one, how often a trait is likely to appear, two, how often a trait will appear, three, how often cells split in half, four, total number of chromosomes. Well, I know four is definitely wrong. Um, pun and square won't tell you the total number of chromosomes. Three, how often cells split? Definitely not going to tell you that. Two, how often a trait will appear? There's some, like, there's a lot of chance involved with inheritance. So it's all about probability. So it's going to be one, a trait likely appears. So one and two are very similar, but one is more accurate because it uh, falls along with the definition of probability more closely. Number 14. All right, in the Punnett square was shown below, how many of the offspring will probably show the dominant trait? So here we have the parent, which is homozygous dominant. Here we have another parent, it's homozygous recessive. And look at all the offsprings have a dominant trait. So it said probably showing a dominant trait. Well, all of them have the dominant trait and dominant mass recessive. And none of them are going to show the recessive trait, so it's four. Four out of four.